as I mentioned, I'll be talking about the intercorporate dividends and the changes. So first we're going to look at the background, then we're going to have a look at what happens when subsection 55 to apply. Uh, we'll quickly look at the new changes that happened this year. And then lastly, we're going to look at if dividends can actually still be paid in, uh, tax free intercorporately. So in the March budget, the Minister of Finance announced some changes that, um, to the current dividend rules. Uh, this is one of the areas that most clients and accountants have happily ignored in the past and just assumed that everything is tax-free. As most of you are aware, um, where a parent company owns more than 10% of the votes and value of an uh, operating company, that there is a deduction available to the parent company and that in effect causes the dividend to be tax-free to the parent company. Um, this presentation is mainly focused on intercompany dividends because the dividends between a uh, corporation and its individual shareholders have actually not changed. So when did the old uh, subsection 55-2 rules apply? Um, as I mentioned, the old section 55-2 rules applied um, to intercorporate dividends. The rules uh, apply where one of the main purposes of a dividend is to reduce the capital gain uh, in a series of transactions. One of the common examples that you will have is where a holding company decides to sell one of his operating companies. The buyer of the new company is not interested in buying some of the assets that are currently in the operating company, and therefore the seller decides to dividend some of these assets up to the parent company on a tax deferred basis. Um, by doing that, the parent company is reducing the capital gain that it would have had on the disposition of the operating company shares. So that is where the reduction of the capital gain would have been. As I, um, as I might have mentioned, this is an over oversimplified example. Um, generally, there's a whole bunch of steps involved and it gets quite complex, but that kind of is the example of it. So how can we get out of these 55-2 rules? How do we get out of it before? First one is a safe income example, um, a safe income exemption. Simply put, it's tax retained earnings. Um, the second one is to pay part four tax on the dividend. And then the dividend would not be a tax free dividend, so the rules would not apply to it. The third one is to use the related party exemption. And this is where the majority of our shares generally fell into before. And a lot of companies and individuals um, a lot of company structures relied on this because the companies are related, so the related party exemptions would have. Um, this would not have been available if there was a sale to a third party. Um, there would be some other steps that you would have to take. The third exemption is a butterfly transaction, and I'm sure a lot of people have heard of it, and it sounds very nice and everything. Um, an example of that is where you split up a company where, where unrelated parties are involved. This is also common where a family splits up a company between siblings because children are not, uh, siblings are not related for this section of the act. Or if you're splitting up a public company. So what happens if subsection 55-2 applies? Uh, the dividend is considered to not have been paid by the paying company or received. And the dividend is actually reclassified as a capital gain to the recipient company. So it gets taxed as a capital gain, and you're actually taking a tax-free dividend, and now you're going to be paying tax on this um, transaction. Therefore, you can see it's not the ideal place to be. So what changed? Well, as I mentioned, the March 2016 budget came out, and it introduced new rules for intercorporate dividends. This was in reaction to the perceived abuse of the previous legislation, um, for instance, a D&D livestock case. In the D&D livestock case, the taxpayer um, reduced the capital gain by using a complex set of transactions that resulted in a, t um, a stock dividend that was paid. By using a stock dividend, a combination of other uh, transactions, they ended up using a safe income on hand, so the tax retained earnings twice, and the CRA obviously didn't like that. So naturally, the CRA and the Ministry of Finance had to go back and redraft all the legislation to deal with this kind of issue. So, so what kind of changes did we have? 
Uh, previously, we had the one purpose test, and as I mentioned, that is when the purpose is to reduce a capital gain in a series of transactions. So the new legislation introduced two new purpose tests. The first one is the reduction of the fair market value of any of the shares um, in the company. And the last one is the increase in the cost base of properties. So how do we get out of it? You still have the ability of using a safe income on hand, but they have limited the use of the safe income on hand significantly, um, especially where there is a potential um, capital gain. So your safe income on hand is only available where you're, you have a gain available to you. So if your cost base of your shares and your fair market value of the shares are the same, you don't have the ability to use the safe income on hand anymore. Um, so I, they also changed the part four exemptions and it's a lot more limited in use. And the last one is a related party exemption that only um, relates to the redemption of shares now. Uh, this is actually, it's a major change and uh, this is one of the big things where a lot of us suddenly st started looking at this thinking, you know, we've relied on the related party rules, um, companies owning each other in a related group, you've got tax-free dividends, and now we have to step back and think, how are we going to deal with this? What is available to us? So in a lot of cases, you're actually going to have to go back and look at the safe income on hand. And since a lot of companies have been operating for so many years, it's really, it's a big calculation and it's quite, yeah, it gets quite a big calculation if you have to go back from incorporation. So let's have a look when, uh, at an example of how we uh, fall into this purpose test, number two, which is a dividend to reduce the fair market value of a share. Look at, uh, let's look at the scenario, company A, owns all of the shares of company B. The adjusted cost base and the fair market value of the shares is $1 million. Company A then decides to invest an additional $1 million into company B and receives shares worth $1 million back. So now you've got the adjusted cost base and the fair market value of the shares at $2 million. Company B then decides to pay a dividend up to company A of $1 million and thereby reducing the fair market value of the shares of company B to $1 million. But it doesn't have the same adjustment to the cost base. So you still have a cost base of $2 million, but your fair market value is $1 million because that's all that company B is worth now. So you can see that CRA really did not like this thing where now suddenly you've got cost base um, but you don't actually have any value in there, and especially if it's part of a series of transactions. Um, but the old 55-2 rules would not necessarily have applied to this. You probably could have gotten out of the, 55, the old 55-2 rules because you didn't do this to reduce a capital gain. But test number two would apply because you have reduced the fair market value of the shares of this company. So how did tax people used this previously to get away with not paying tax. Well, it will be an example of company A then decides to transfer an asset to company B, worth a million dollars, but no cost space. Suddenly company B is back worth $2 million and it's got to adjust the cost base of $2 million. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention, the transfer was on a tax deferred basis, so there was no tax triggered on the transfer from the asset to company B. So now you've got a cost base and a fair market value of $2 million, and company A can go ahead and sell the shares of company B and not trigger any gain. So you can see why CRA really didn't like this situation or this scenario. Let's look at um, example that covers uh, purpose test number two and three, so reduction in the fair market value and the creation of adjusted cost base. We've got a similar scenario. You've got company A owning all of the shares of company B and the cost base and the fair market value of the shares is once again $1 million. Company A then decides to incorporate a third company, company C, 
but for nominal value. So the adjusted cost base and the fair market value of the shares of company C is nominal. It's, there's no value. Company A then decides to transfer the shares that it's got full cost base and the, class B, uh, the co company B shares to company C. And it receives back shares worth a million dollars. And then uh, now company C is worth one million dollars because the asset that it owns is worth a million dollars. So we've got full cost base in the shares. Right, your cost base and your fair market value of your uh, company C shares are worth a million dollars. So at the moment we don't really have a problem, right? Because we haven't paid a dividend yet. So next step, company C then decides to pay out a dividend of the class uh, company B shares to company A. So it's paying back the company B shares to company A by a dividend. Um, Due to the way the rules work and everything, the shares of company B have full cost um, value and uh, equal to the fair market value. So you've got a cost base and a fair market value of $1 million in the cost, uh, company B shares. But this dividend didn't reduce the cost base of the company C shares. It just reduced the fair market value. So there you can see it reduced the fair market value, so you've fallen into purpose test number two. And by suddenly now you've got $2 million of total cost base because you've got $1 million of cost base in company C and you've got $1 million of cost base in company B, you've got $2 million of cost base. So you created another million dollars, which you could potentially do something with, move some assets around and not pay any tax on it. Um, so you can see that Sierra obviously didn't like that either. And that's a kind of situation that would fall into that. So let's look at a broad application. How would this apply to the majority of companies that we see out there? A common example would be Mr. A owning all of the shares of a holding company. The holding company owns the shares of a whole bunch of different operating company. The operating company are paying regular annual dividends um, up to a central holding company. As I mentioned, this is a very common structure for a lot of our large private company groups. The operating companies earn money and they choose to pay it out as a dividend as opposed to a management fee. Um, and then the holding company actually pays it out to Mr. A, um, depending on how much they need. There is no sale contemplated by Mr. A or the holding company, so you don't have to worry about the third party um, problems that you could potentially have. But since you have paid a dividend up to the holding company, you have reduced the fair market value of the, uh, of the operating companies by taking the money out of the companies. So as a result, those dividends could potentially be reclassified, uh, recharacterized as capital gains. And once again, you'll see that this is a very common scenario and the purpose test number two is so extremely broad that it could potentially capture pretty much any dividend that you're going to be paying out there. So you're going to have to, in a situation like this, we would definitely recommend that you do go back and recalculate your safe income on hand calculations um, because that, is, that would be one of the ways that you can deal with this. If, or the redemption of shares. So, so let's talk about some of the other changes that came in the March budget. Stock dividend um, was probably one of the bigger other changes that was there. And paying a stock dividend, an intercorporate stock uh, dividend now, would definitely create a lot of problems. I mean, you really have to think about the reason why you're doing it. The, par uh, the purpose of a stock dividend in itself is to reduce the fair market value of other shares that is held out there. Um, as most of you are probably aware, as soon as you pay a stock dividend, a lot of us have used the stock dividends in the past to freeze the value of a company. So that was one of the ways. So that would reduce the value in the other shares. And therefore, it will meet one of the purpose tests. The amount of the dividend um, would be used to determine the capital gain that is received by the recipient corporation. 
And the dividend amount for the purpose of this section would be the greater of the increase in the paid up capital, or uh, simply put, the state of capital, we usually use that, and the fair market value of this dividend that was paid out, or of the stock dividend that was paid out. And as I mentioned, that could be quite a big amount. So the capital gain received by the recipient company could be quite large. Um, and that is an amount that general, uh, in the past would not have been included even as a dividend. So CRA really went and they really went into this to try and um, capture all of these dividends. So please note, this only applies to stock dividends as intercorporate dividends. It doesn't apply to stock dividends that are still paid to individuals. That is something completely different. So can we still pay dividends? The answer is yes, but um, there's significant concern um, for all tax people um, from the, uh, resulting from the response or the lack of response that we have received from CRA in regards to the application of these rules. Um, CRA has mentioned that generally purification dividends and regular dividends would be fine but they don't go into a lot of detail, so we're not 100% comfortable, so it's a very uneasy time as a tax professional. Safe income on hand calculations would become extremely important going forward. Um, you'll have to go back, every, uh, for, every private, uh, for every company, go back and recalculate the safe income on hand calculations. Unfortunately, it's something that needs to start from incorporation, so it is a big calculation. Um, it is something we can help with. I know I've got a couple of clients that we do it for already, and um, it is a big calculation, but you know, it, it's gonna be extremely important. Consider redeeming shares where possible. If you've got intercorporate group, uh, groups with um, shares in between, so old free shares or something like that sitting around, that you have preferred shares in there, maybe consider redeeming them. Then you can still make use of the related party rules and you don't have to necessarily go back and do all of your safe income and hand calculations, even though I would still do them. But consider redeeming shares on a go forward basis. Um, and then one of the last things is to consider, and not consider, start documenting the purpose of each dividend. It is, extremely important. The new rules that were given out by the CRA have three purpose tests. So if you can document and show that the purpose was not one of those tests, uh, one of the items that they had, um, I think it will be definitely helping you in the future. Um, for instance, if your purpose is to repay a shareholder loan or deal with something like that, then maybe start putting it in the minutes and start doing it well before you think sort of anything could happen, or if there's a sale, or any big transactions happening. Start making it a habit. And I know a lot of people are switching over to management fees, and I am not 100% convinced that that is necessarily the right thing to do. Uh, management fees still need to be reasonable. Um, no matter what your management fee is, you need to make sure that it's reasonable. So I don't think, and in closing, I don't think dividends are gonna go away. I think we're still gonna keep on paying into corporate dividends, but I think you probably need to talk to someone before you decide to pay a dividend, especially if it's a large dividend. Come and talk to someone or have one of your in-house tax specialists or someone calculate, go back and do the calculation for you. So, thank you. <laughs>